2019 Women's World Cup is here, and the defending champions, the U.S. Women's National Team, are the favorites headed into what is expected to be the most competitive Women's World Cup ever. But the most important contest isn't happening on the field. It's happening between the teams and their federations. Whether it's for pay disparity or safety concerns, women's national soccer teams are taking a stand against inequities. All around the globe, national federations are mistreating or completely ignoring their women's teams. Now, the teams are fighting back. In 2015, the Australian women's national team canceled a sellout tour of the United States amid a dispute over their pay. In 2016, the Nigerian Super Falcons staged a sit-in in the capital until they received the bonuses they were owed for winning the Women's Africa Cup of Nations. For every time there are issues, the girls have to be the ones to understand that there's a problem or just understand, oh, please bear with us. And they were, we were done bearing with anybody. In Chile, female football players formed a union that convinced the Chilean Federation to host the Copa America. The Chilean team would not be playing in the 2019 World Cup were it not for the voluntary labor, blood, sweat, tears of the players themselves and the grassroots fans and former players. The most high profile case is in the U.S., where the U.S. women's national team has been locked in a wage dispute with U.S. soccer for four years. There's sort of this simmering tension between their own federation and this team as they head to a World Cup is definitely a huge, huge step for that team. And they're using the platform of the World Cup to just constantly say like, yes, we're here, we're on the world's best stage, but also we're not satisfied with what our own federation is giving us. On International Women's Day, the U.S. Women's National Team filed a gender discrimination suit against U.S. soccer. Female footballers are fed up because all around the globe, federations refuse to make women's sports a priority. The Jamaican women's national team only exists thanks to funding support from Bob Marley's daughter, Sadella. In 2014, the Spanish Football Federation spent less than 1% of its soccer budget on the women's team. And in Argentina, the federation actually stopped accepting invitations for the women's team to play for nearly two years. When you talk about pay equity, I mean, it's it's a joke in Argentina. We're not even, it's not even close. Often, this mistreatment is rooted in sexism, bigotry, and homophobia. In 2005, the South African Football Association announced plans to send the women's team to etiquette classes and supply a more fitted uniform to soften their image. During the last Women's World Cup, the president of women's football in Brazil said that women's uniforms used to lack elegance and femininity. But thanks to shorter shorts and done-up hairstyles, they no longer look like a woman dressed as a man. There's just devastating treatment of, of women there, the, you know, a sexual harassment, discrimination, racism. Not one player on that team has come out as openly gay. I think that's because of real fear of retribution. All of those examples come from teams that qualify for the Women's World Cup. In the rest of the world, things are often far worse. Take Afghanistan. The players risked their own safety to found the women's national team 12 years ago and slowly garnered institutional support. Then in 2018, Susie Rack from The Guardian reported allegations of extensive physical and sexual abuse perpetrated by Federation officials. Reading the story itself made me physically ill because she details such things as the way that Kareem Karimuddin, the head of the Afghanistan Football Federation, himself sexually abused players and would do things such as have a lock, uh, a fingerprint identifying lock on his door so they couldn't go or come and would threaten them with exposing them as lesbians. And it created an absolute culture of fear There's still a long way to go, but progress is being made. We've seen historic equal pay agreements in places like Norway and New Zealand in recent years. And right before the 2019 Women's World Cup, the South African team learned that their federation will pay them the same bonuses as the men. For South Africa, it was a major, major breakthrough. While the fight for equal pay is important, this battle is about so much more. 
When we talk to many footballers around the world, the one thing they don't talk about is only winning. For Africa, football is, is such a unifying factor. I mean, there's just so much political, tribal, religious lines, but when it's football for 90 minutes, everyone forgets everything and, you know, join in, in the congregation in a way. In front, quick shot, there's another goal. The hometown girl strikes, it's Klingenberg. Football can be used to heal. It can be used to unite. It can be used as a tool of empowerment and to develop their communities. They already know this. They need a chance to be able to roll it out. For Team USA, the mission is clear. In order to keep their fight for equality going back home, they need to win big in France. They need a result, really, if they want this lawsuit to go well. If they don't come home with a trophy, it makes their position a little bit harder. And this is definitely the toughest World Cup that we've seen on the women's side pretty much ever. 